I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been having a great week and that you've been putting into practice some of the tips, tricks, and insights you've been learning and picking up, gleaning, if you like, from the guests that we've been featuring here on the Physical Performance Show. This show is all about pursuing your physical best performance and inspiring you to do so, whilst also giving you practical insights into how to get there. Guys, it's been a a real journey that we've been on. This is episode 50, uh, coming up to our one-year anniversary here on the Physical Performance Show, and we've got some great fun things in store, including today's guest, who is the first coach that we've featured here on the program. So today's Guest is Richard Scarce, who's the Australian swim team coaching member, coach of Olympian Cameron McAvoy, and also now a bunch of other Olympic athletes uh, at the Bond University pool here on the Gold Coast. So it's going to be a great episode today. Before we get there, a couple of big thank yous. Thank you to you, the, the faithful and loyal physical performance show listeners who have been tuning in some of you from episode one if it's your first time today welcome if it's your 50th time today thanks for your support with the program massive thank you to those listeners who have uh, left a review on itunes reviews help the program enormously. They, they help it get in more people's earbuds through better visibility on iTunes. So a massive thank you to everyone who's left a review. And for those who have left a review recently, in particular, the Fit Nut, who rated the program five stars. And the Fit Nut said, love Brad's podcast, so motivating and inspiring, especially when completing my long wind trainer sessions. Love hearing from a variety of athletes in an interesting conversation, which Brad manages to unpack so much info. Would love to hear from Libby Trickett and Laura Geist. So Libby and Laura, if you're out there, let's organise uh, an episode and uh, the Fit Nut, we'll see what we can do. But thanks so much for taking the time to leave a review. Also, Dick Michaels, who rated the program five stars. Thanks so much, Dick. Learn something new each episode. These are great podcasts that I listen to on the train. The guests have always have at least one nugget of gold that makes it worthwhile listening to. Keep up the great work, Brad and guests. Now I'm off to practice Cassie's heaves. So, Dick, thanks so much for leaving that review, mate. That's excellent. And I just think it's the beauty of the medium. Whether you are, you're doing long wind trainer sessions in the garage or on a train, uh, you can pop the program in your ears and uh, and enjoy the, the the insights from the guests wherever you are. Today's show is lovingly brought to you as always by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you perform at your physical best through our industry first fixed price and unlimited access two, six and 12 week finish line programs. We say that we want everyone who walks through our door to cross their physio finish line and that basically means we want to give you a high five tell you that we love you, but we don't want to see you anytime soon. Unless, of course, you need maintenance for an injury or you're back with a new injury, then we'd love to be your physio once again. So to find out more about our industry first fixed fee unlimited access programs, jump over to pogophysio.com.au and you'll find all the relevant links. If you missed last week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, episode 49, featuring Ryan Fisher, which went live on the eve of the Super League Triathlon. And at the time of recording, Ryan was poised to jump into the renaissance of Grand Prix Triathlon racing in Australia and really internationally. So uh, at the time of recording this segment, uh, for, for the introduction here for this program, we are literally only a few hours away. I'm recording this as I sit here here on Hamilton Island doing some physiotherapy duties for the Super League Triathlon Series. So we're about to see how Ryan's debut goes, but uh, lots of great feedback that's already trickled through for Ryan in terms of uh, his uh, 
his earnestness about his journey of falling in and out of love with the sport of triathlon. Uh, obviously was in love, making his Olympic debut in Rio last year. So jump back over, episode 49 if you missed that. But let's jump into today's episode and guest featuring Richard Scarce, Australian swim team coach, coach of Cameron McAvoy, one of Australia's hottest swimming prospects. Richard, in, a, in, in addition to coaching Cam, also coaches now some of the Australia's greatest swimmers, including multiple Olympians, at the Bond University pool here on the Gold Coast, the Bull Sharks Swimming Club. And Richard shares earnestly about getting started in coaching, the early days, the less than glamorous roles that he had to fulfill, and the rise through the ranks and the rise in expectations as he's gone about his coaching career, including the pinnacle of it, which was obviously the expectations and the pressures around, uh, in many ways, Cam McAvoy's performances at the Rio Olympic Games. Uh, Richard talks us through the build-up and the after uh, events of Re- the Rio Olympic Games. So it's a great, really candid interview. You're going to really love Rich. So let's jump or let's dive straight in. So listeners, this has been something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, joining us today, uh, sitting here at the practice actually, is Richard Scarce. And as per the bio, Richard is uh, an Australian team member for Swimming Australia, one of the coaching coaching team or staff, and uh, Richard's really had what, I mean, from an outsider looking in point of view, would almost seem like a meteoric rise in coaching to the, the world of uh, inter- international swimming success, but as we're going to hear today, it's far from an overnight sensation. There's been years and years of uh, coaching success behind the scenes. So, Rich, as everyone knows you, mate, welcome along. Thank you very much, Brett. Thanks for having me. Mate, um, I'm going to throw you something curly right out of the gate. And that's sure. what's one thing that scares Richard Scares. <laughs> one thing that scares me. Oh, I suppose um, I suppose my athletes not performing to their full potential. I know we do some great work and it's a bit of a fear, I guess, for most people, but I, I, I don't really think about it in the moment. I just hope that they can you know, be at their, at their best when we want it, when we need it most. Yeah. And Rich, uh, like practically, um, what, what's your role as a coach when an athlete does underperform for whatever reason of which there's many? Um, you know, what's, what's, what would you say is your sort of philosophy to um, help them uh, you know, get past the disappointment and move on? Oh, I think, uh, I think. When there's a performance that's not quite as good as they'd hoped for, or we'd hoped for, uh, we, we just sort of, I like to, uh, yeah, the athlete sort of likes to come straight over and start to talk about perhaps what, what went wrong, but I think I like to let it just sink in a little bit and just uh, let the moment sort of go through and uh, and then then discuss it on the pool deck uh, as they're swimming, after they swim down, just have, you know, everything's calmed down a little bit and just really uh, analyse, I suppose, how the race went, um, firstly, and then uh, from there to sort of work backwards through the preparation, I guess, um, just to see where we could improve or what we felt could have been better or, or you know, what strong points. Um, it could have been a little bit stronger, I guess, or we didn't, we got away from something or, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a process, isn't it, just analysing those that, that preparation, yeah, I like working that backwards. So. Work and analyse. Mm. I like that saying that, Experience is a good teacher, but evaluate experience is where the real lessons are, you know, learned. Would you say you're an analytic, analytical, and you know, type of coach that does go through things with a fine tooth comb? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably, uh, I can be. I don't. I think it's also a feeling as well. I think just, um, yeah, coaches sense a bit of a knack for it. I suppose uh, gives you a sense of <clears throat> perhaps you know, if the performance went well or or not so good. Um, yeah, so I'm not an over-analyzer, but I just it's it's more of a feel on things as well, just in in, in the general preparation, because all those rehearsals build up yeah. to that one moment, so it's a lot of things, but <laughs> to think about. So, Rich, uh, art and science, I mean, it's often thrown around. It's in my work. I'm a clinician in a treatment room, and yep. if I broke it down into art and science, I actually look at my work as probably 60% art and 40% science because there's just so much to things that you intuitively do that you just know will work and different things obviously you're still across the data and the literature what about your philosophy on your coaching 
Yeah, I'd have to agree with you, Brad. I, I, I think it's probably even a greater value than that for me, the art of it, I suppose. The um, in actual coaching, I think it can be the science can uh, overtake somewhat. Uh, you know, it, it's very important. I think all those things and the data and and the uh, the measuring of all those things is very important. But I, I, th- I do think the coaching side of it's the key part and the belief behind that as well. It really drives it along. So I agree. It's a greater percentage of <laughs> coaching and art than, than the science. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a nice balance, I think. So, I mean, in the world of ever-growing <coughs> data access, yeah. you know, I, I certainly feel it in my world uh, professionally mm. uh, as an elite-level coach, you know, on the Australian team, you must have data galore available to you, not just from those programs, but also in-house with, you know, the, the Bond University swimming program. How do you determine what's important and what's not with, with, with the data that you do have available to you? Is it individualised yeah. to the athletes I mean, as, as opposed to the squad? or? Yeah, it's a little bit more individual. I think, uh, I mean, generally across the board, I try to, I try to take in, like I won't ignore all things that are thrown at you for sure I'm not that silly I just think it's um, you can listen in you can research uh, data and, and science and you, we've got a lot of help with sports science and, and that's great so I don't sort of uh, turn my back on any of that but I just I, I kind of appreciate the, the input and I'll just use what I think is necessary for more of the individual athlete and I think if they're already highly athletic or some aren't so much we'll just apply a bit more yeah, technique and science to, to them, and try, but more incorporating into the training. Uh, for me, it's more of a practicality than, you know, what is the issue, and then and trying to apply that to to daily rehearsal more than anything. Yeah, you, you can measure it and all the rest of it, but um, uh, I think I like to do a fair bit of uh, skill work, and then we'll sort of come back and revisit that in a testing format. It, periodically, not not too often. Yep. Just so you have time to work on it. Yep. And that's up to me as a coach, I suppose, to address that and and really apply that. So on your, on your coaching evolution, Rich, uh, how did it start for you? I mean, uh, where did where did this journey that oh, you've been on start? Yeah, I'd probably have to drop names here. Like Laurie Lawrence was probably one that really struck a chord with me. When I was sixteen, watching the '88 uh, Seoul Olympics, and uh, Duncan Armstrong winning, of course, and uh, beating getting over the top of Matt Biondi and uh, just seeing Laurie, you know, his carry on and at this infamous sort of video footage from there and I was watching it live and just his passion and love for it and I, and I already loved swimming and I was a swimmer of course and um, not to the heights of the guys I coach but, but I loved it and I thought, oh, you know, one day if I stop swimming I might get into the coaching side of this looks pretty fun, you know, just, just um, yeah, it's a lot of work but I just thought that, that sort of really struck a chord as I said and um, yeah, and I just... Towards the end of my swimming, just got into the coaching side of it. Um, jumped down on deck with uh, Mr. John Carew, who coached Kieran Perkins. I was swimming with the squad for a couple of years, and I just got out and asked him if I wouldn't mind learning some skill off him, coaching wise, and making a start. So, what year, year or years was that with John Carew up in Brisbane? Uh, that was sort of 97, 98. Yep. Yeah. So, this was just off the back of Kieran's 96 Atlanta yeah. Olympic Atlanta success. Atlanta Magic, yeah. Which was, you know, uh, one of the signature <laughs> swims for Australia. Oh, yeah, it was magic. Man. And so, awesome. you, you were still swimming in the pool at that stage? Yeah, I was still yeah, trying, to, trying to work landscape gardening and, and training, and but just learning as much as I could. It just fascinated me the top athletes and the coaches, and a lot of respect for the coaches like Mr Carew and uh, he had so much experience and knowledge and yeah I had a, a crappy little stopwatch that I was using he said oh first things first put that away take the blankets off the pool and <laughs> he took it right back to basics for me <laughs> just to see if I'd hang around but I did of course and yeah I just went from there then on the southport after that how um, long did you hang around for uh up in Brisbane then I had a couple, you say hang around you know yeah I had a couple of years um or swimming and then and toward, towards the end of that a little bit of coaching and then we moved to the Gold Coast yep. as a family. As a family. So, yeah. And, and family life for you, Rich. Uh, we often talk about your busy world, but uh, you've got uh, to, to give listeners a picture, beautiful children, wife, Bronnie. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wife's a dietitian, so she's always harping me about food. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've a lot to learn there, but uh, and two beautiful girls. Um, yeah, sort of... 11 and 10 now so it's a busy life uh yeah with her work and my coaching and a lot of trips overseas and so that's a difficult one to manage but uh as most people these days we're working families and yeah but anyway we try to manage the best we can and 
if you want to do really well, I suppose, in the in my game um, or anyone's game, you've, you've you've just got to manage your time and do your best with that. I, I suppose, not waste not waste too much time. Not waste time. <laughs> yeah. And so, Rich, I mean, you, you juggle, and we'll get to your day a day in the life of you know your mm. coaching world as we go. But mate, um, so move from uh, Brisbane to the Gold Coast, uh, family move. Um, what was the if you had to summarize it to one summarize it to one thing? What was the key learning you could take from your years under, as you say, Mister Carew there at Brisbane? Coaching oh, Karen? I just just flat out his results with Karen and in good times and out of form times with with his swimmer and uh, well, he has he had a bunch of great swimmers and uh, yeah, just just I think the experience in his life he was a, he was also a horse trainer and background and yeah, so I mean. Just I, I just really valued his. He's quite innovative, you know, just changing his particular training sets, making it a bit more specific to achieve a goal and results that he wanted. Individualising for Kieran, I suppose, I really admired that. Just didn't do the same as everyone else. He really took it to another level, yeah, which right. you saw Kieran swim at. So yeah. yeah, well, yeah, I mean, to do things no one's done, it's probably yeah. quite that in training, and right? You can't do it the same as them. Moving forward, either so you have to have a way yourself to so you'd say like <laughs> who that. you've got you're yeah. working with in your stable, and well, you know we'll get to you know mm. your current current scene. So, mate, um, Gold Coast spent some years at Southport Aquatic there, Southport Pool, yeah, and then uh, part of the story also then some years at PBC. That's um, right, yeah, Grumman, yeah. I, was... I had a few years. So I had about um, eight or nine years at Southport Olympic <clears throat> and uh, coaching juniors there, age group national kids. Uh, I coached alongside uh, one of Doug Frost, who used to coach Ian Thorpe, yep. to winning in Sydney. Uh, I learned a massive amount through Doug, incredibly experienced coach and uh, very professional. I learned an incredible amount there. And he was, um, yeah, he still is a very good mentor of mine. And uh, yeah, very, very challenging coach. So I, I took a lot and made it my own way uh, with my swimmers, I suppose. Uh, so he's great, stay in touch with Doug and he still mentors me now. I'll just ring him occasionally and just for his opinion on just experience, I think, yeah. more than anything. He thinks I'm coaching well, but I, you're always learning, but right. um, for sure, you know, in the big moments. But uh, then on to Palm Beach, Corumban, the first head coach role there, uh, 2008 to, to, uh, to 2015, and, so seven years there. And first head coach role at this mm. stage, Rich, you'd been coaching for how many years total? Uh, approximately? Approximately? Sort of. Coaching juniors from '99, yeah. but more, more into the state, state group, state development, sort of about 2003. Yeah. So five years, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we uh, had a few kids at national age records. Yep. Yeah, age group sort of success. Some work with the senior swimmers yep. while the coaches are away. And you mentioned yeah. that uh, Doug <coughs> was a challenging coach. Uh, what do you mean by that, Rich? <laughs> well, I mean he challenged the swimmers. Extraordinarily, and also me, I think he really tested to see if I wanted to do it or not. Uh, coaching and uh, really sort of certain sessions, you know, I'd be coaching the kids and oh, you're sprinting them too much, too much sprint, you know. <laughs> it's the first time this week, <laughs> Doug. Well, yeah, he'd blow up at me. Well, if you don't want to do it, I'll get someone else who can do it. <laughs> I said, Oh, I can do it. He's all right. No need to get so, de- so defensive. I was like, Jeez, he's a hard, hard old man. <laughs> But um, no, he really challenged me and uh, realised that I was there all those early mornings and and really putting a lot into the to the kids and then starting to get the results as well, which he it was hard to please Doug. It took a couple of years as a good coaching coach and I really but I really valued that because it was it was hard to get those compliments or the next step up to get a coach so accomplished as himself and others to, to start to take notice and, yeah. and give you a little bit more. So the more you put in and you get. Yeah, you get back as it well. Sounds like uh, performing in the pool, doesn't it? Eh? Yeah, ideas, yeah. It's very, <laughs> so very hard. There's no shortcuts, right? <laughs> no. So no. head coach PBC, um, mm. and then you know, f- f- from an outsider looking in point of view, th- this is where some real results started to happen with your, your coaching stable. Give listeners a bit of a insight into your years at PBC, that then seeded your mm. years in obviously your current Bond University swimming program, which is. You know, such a strong program now. So, talk about the PBC years, maybe first, Rich. Uh, yeah, part of me was great. I, I went down to join Cole Samuelson there. He got me down there, um, 2008, to take on the head coach role with their boss, Michael Wendon, who's a former Olympian. 
Um, and I was really excited about that. We didn't really have many swimmers as such. I had a couple of state level swimmers that came down from Southport with me. And uh, I remember one of the coaches saying, you know, well, who have you got? And I said, well, no one really, just young, young kids in a group of t- 10 males and two females, I think. Anyway, we sort of, I think the club was sitting about 75th in the state at that point at Queensland Champs. And Kyle and I had goals of, you know, working together and I had my group and he had his juniors and we'd just sort of plot this course of how we're going to improve the, the, the club point score at, at State. And I think we got to 14th in our first year. I've been there about seven months. And then the following year, so 18 months later, uh, seventh in the State. So it's about 250 uh, yeah, plus clubs in the State. So that, that was really, we felt really proud of that. And, but just the results of the kids as well. And, and also uh, the younger ones, the... Um, developing the different strokes and distances. We're, we're sort of proud that they're all really lifting and improving together and, and um, across the board, not just our, the, the, the top swimmers. There were always some ones there that were already going pretty well. But, um, yeah, it just grew from that. And, and then on a national age, qualifying kids, and which is a big thing for them just to qualify to go to national age. You know, it's such a high level in Queensland and Australia. Um, and those guys winning gold medals and setting... Yeah, you know, national age records such as you know, Elijah Winnington, you know, a young fellow we've had since he was eight. Uh, so lots of markers there. And then, of course, the senior guys arriving, um, Cameron McAvoy coming along um, with Andrew Digby and Hayden McAvoy those, uh, and Brittany, you know, a couple of guys sort of joining up. And, and that sort of went on a different tangent again with the senior guys and uh, really high level. And, and what year was that, a, Rich? That was 2012. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Ahead so, of London. So, uh, no, just after, just, just off the London. back, yeah. Yep. They sort of hadn't done much for a few months, a couple of months, I think, off, and then they sort of had a meeting and then they just decided they wanted to yep. swim there. And uh, I had to apply what just what I thought, all my training methods and to camp, so it would have been a little bit different for him, but I, I felt confident for someone like him we could do really well with him. I did that with all my swimmers, and, and it's the same for most of them, but maybe a little tweak here and there, but I... It's always a hard sell, and they're established somewhat already, you know, at an older age, when he was 18, just to, turned 18. But, yeah, so and a big job ahead, a lot of pressure, I suppose, for him and him and I, and as far as mm. let's keep developing this and see how we go. And, you know, a lot of help from peers, but ultimately you've got to do it yourself. And I think really we had a good first year at Worlds. He went under 48 and got fourth within a couple of tenths of a second could have won it but but you know and, and so that was a good result we just kept growing from there and, and over the time more guys have come in some have moved on and or finished up or but that senior swimming and, and it just sort of helped the juniors love seeing that as well so it's yeah. just a just a different chapter and you know higher level I suppose but the same thing you still want them to go as well as the, <laughs> the juniors go well and all the rest of it so it's no different to you know whether they're you know uh, Olympic selection or national age no, it's not the same, at all. same input from I guess yeah they got the same area. goals absolutely yeah, yeah. 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 Um, no dilution of effort for them it's the same <clears throat> yep they, so, they invest a lot of time into it yeah families so. families as well mm. so Rich with um, with you know that sort of time 2012 you know, it's you know you've you've, you've uh, had Cam join. You know, you guys have partnered up. Uh, you've got some other swimmers coming across, and then mm. you know Bond University program uh, kicked off, um, mm. and you know it's just gone from strength to strength. So give listeners a bit of perspective on you know on your coaching now, what it looks like. Yeah, it was. Um, we felt like a bit. Of, we needed a bit of a change there. <clears throat> um, Palm Beach was great. We just sort of the Bond University. Swimming club uh, head coach role came up, and I uh, maybe 2015, I think March. I was sort of talking to the director of sport, Gary Newsom, for there about that, and we over a month or so of discussions, and decided to take that on, and and they've added a lot to the facility as far as you know, Omega uh, kicker blocks and new lane ropes and a bulkhead and all those sort of things, and new gym. So that's been that's been nice, but it's more about the squad and coming in there and in a different environment and uh and yes yeah a few new faces we had a few that sort of came with us but um and some that stayed back at the club at palm beach which is great we didn't ask anyone to move on or anything like that it just it was just a change and we thought we you know let's try and develop something there as well like we did at palm beach and get some real improvement high performance swimming i suppose uh for the uni was what they wanted but also club the feel that people could come and train, even juniors. We have junior coach there and age group coaching, so we we don't want that elitist 
tag or anything like that. It's just an opportunity for people in the area to to, uh, to train with us and some of the best swimmers in the world and uh, perhaps further their, further their education after school at uni there or or not, you know, but that, that's... And it's a good environment. We don't like them to be acting any other way than that either. So it's the same principles as Palm Beach or for Kyle and I, anyway, and me as the head coach, um, the same down-to-earth sort of attitude and, and good, honest, hard work and de- developing the club and helping each other. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and Rich, in terms of... Uh, I mean, let's just unpack a few years and some of the highlights and <laughs> generally they want to really shift gears under your philosophies around coaching, mm. but just, I guess, in chronology, sort of sharing your story and coaching, this evolution of the squad. Mm. Uh, 2012, obviously, you mentioned Cam was, I guess... the in some ways, from a public perception, the first signature swimmer that probably joined your stable, obviously the others were all up and coming, mm. uh, went to London as a 17-year-old, uh, already was setting, you know, I believe that stage Queensland records and mm. things. Fast forward, and we're leaving a fair chunk of the story out of here, but say fast forward to 2016 Australian Swimming Championships trials for Rio Olympic Games, so yep. the Rio Olympic Games, and Cam went the triple, the 50, the 100, the 200 free, the first man Australian to ever do that, Swam the third fastest 100 free, I think, in in, in history. Mm. Um, at that point, could have you as a coach ever have imagined that, you know, that, sharing that journey with one of your athletes? Oh, yeah, I, it was, I start to pinch myself, I think. <laughs> Sometimes it's quite euphoric, but I, um, I guess I did believe it. Even when I was younger, I, I believe that, you know, if you back yourself and you have the great mentors and you put the work in behind that and you believe in it, you know, and, and along with the athlete, that it is achievable. So I was kind of, um, yeah, just oh, just really proud that, that he yeah. Yeah. did make you know, make the uh, the change and and come to me and had an athlete that are willing to work with you like that, along with the others as well. And um, then that belief just keeps growing. And then to get the results is just the icing on the cake. I think it's like. Um, yeah, just a reward for all the hard work and, uh, yeah, belief behind it, I suppose. Uh, for them mainly, like, it's just great to see them. They work so hard, you know, and you, you, you know you've got some targets and for them to achieve it um, at the trials and in front of the, in, you know, home country uh, is, is fantastic. You know, it's a great feeling. Yeah, <laughs> but I like what you say that, you, you know, yes, it was euphoric and it was like, you know, pinch yourself type of moment because mm. that's part of history, but swimming history, but... It, the belief was always there. It was obviously always there, even when you were uh, putting your stopwatch away for Mr. Carew and doing the pool covers. You know? Yeah, yeah, have a few doubts then when they <laughs> when you're very grand around the. Yeah, but you know, you're always learning. I've always got respect for the older coaches and the younger ones too. Everyone knows something yep. and something to add. So yeah, as long as you're pretty open. Yeah, you'll, you'll learn <laughs> it. about you, yeah, that's right. And, and Rich, uh, I have a memory, it was quite bizarre, this, the timelines of it, and we're just going to go back a notch to the mm. uh, Com Games uh, in Glasgow 2014. Yeah. Uh, I was on a plane, the same plane that incidentally you as a coaching team, part of the Australian coaching team at that stage, uh, were on, and I was on the plane with my family going back to see Christina's biological dad and all her family in Portugal. Mm. I was quite upset though because I wasn't going to be able to catch all the games action because of the time zones and we're in this little village in in, uh, in Portugal. But anyway, I'm getting on the plane and I look around. Here's this this smiling <laughs> face with the big beard, and it was you, mate. <laughs> it was Rich Gas. And I think we said g'day and off we went. We're in customs yeah, yeah. there. But um, but mate, uh, right, that right. beard you carted that beard around for quite a while. Uh, what was the story with the beard yeah. there, Rich? Yeah, it's own sort of. Uh, yeah. And for listeners, we'll take it up in the show notes with a picture because this thing was uh, legendary. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's a few greys in it now, but yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah. I just I think I went on a uh, a camping trip with the family after Worlds World Championships in Barcelona 2013, and we went to Northwest Island. It's a very remote island up off Gladstone there, and of course you don't bring your razors, and it just started to grow. And I thought I'll I'll keep going with this, and a few months later, you know, you're at trials, and it's it's gaining momentum and and thickness, and grew the hair a bit as well. So it's um, you know, it's just. Uh, yeah, it just sort of, uh, well, yeah, it grew on me, obviously, <laughs> pardon the pun, but it, um, yeah, just felt like I didn't feel any different, you know, <laughs> to what I normally am, but it was just um, just fun, a bit of fun. The guys admiring the, the length it was growing to every every month or two and uh, <laughs> when am I going to shave it off and, you know, do the great shave and all sort of thing. Is it is it some sort of magical beard for performance? <laughs> you know, any superstitions? 
behind it, but uh, yeah, no, it was nothing like that, but just a bit of fun. Um, but yeah, I was there for over a year, and uh, I looked like a drowned rat or a <laughs> a, a, a sailor in a storm or something on a ship. But um, in, in the pan packs at uh, Gold Coast, because that was pretty wild weather, as you remember, there and um, yeah, drenched and a little plastic poncho on, and sort of cheering when Cam had a win there, and <laughs> so and it sort of panned to me, I think, and I, I thought, God, look, you look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> pretty rough there, a bit Robinson Crusoe-ish, but um, yeah, that was fun. You know, it was just a good, a good chapter, and uh, yeah, come on, games. I had it over there as well. I think I've got to mention on the Louds <laughs> Vega for one. I don't know, someone teed him up <laughs> for the for the commentary there. You know, across the whole pool. And oh, there's one I've never. That's a great beard. I like, no. <laughs> I've, I've seen some around the Gold Coast. And mom is uh, pretty average, but yeah. No, look. mate, I, I was up there. It's, it's a wonder at these international, uh, you know, events that you didn't get uh, labelled as Australian Ed Kelly. But uh, uh, yeah, I had a few of those calls, all you? kinds of yeah. yeah but mate, some was, good, some not so good nicknames. <laughs> and here you are, freshly shaven, rich. But, trying, mate, to, trying to look younger, Brad. Was that uh, was uh, the Com Games or the World Champs? Which was your first in, uh, post? the Australian senior team for, as a coach which one was your uh, that was my first one was um, the world championships in 2013 Barcelona Barcelona yeah 2013 yep. um, I'd only been on junior before that like a trans Tasman yeah junior national age coaching and that sort of thing but yeah first senior team 2013 uh, Commonwealth Games Panpax 2014 um, world champs of course uh, 2015 and then Rio was last year but um, Australian teams like BHP and Perth have been on a few of those and and a world short course champs at the end of um, 2014 I think when you treated me for my tennis back <laughs> or whatever it was yeah, whatever I might call the other thing. Yeah, we'll go with that diagnosis yeah, yeah, that's right. I might get some uh, emails uh, from physios um, Rich uh, that first just, just briefly on that, that first international uh, Australian senior team was that quite validating for all the years of uh, behind the scenes you know, effort you'd put in did it feel like great of, you know. oh definitely that, that's uh, yeah that was I remember I was very close to missing the cut off as I have a certain amount of coaches and and I was kind of near the end of that, and I, but I made it on, and um, with Cameron's performances, and uh, of course you look after a bunch of swimmers when you when you go over to uh, to the staging camp and the competition, and I was really proud to represent Australia, and yeah, it was, it was a really defining moment for me in coaching, and um, I thought well, I've got a really big job here, you know, just <clears throat> living up to the so many great coaches now and before me, and will be in the future, so it's um, yeah, it's a it's a a very important gig and um, I take very seriously and uh, you know as long as I'm still enjoying it and very pr- proud to represent uh, Australia I'll be um, doing my best on the team and if I think it's time and years to come down the track that I can't do that I'll, I'll certainly step off because there's plenty of great coaches <laughs> behind me so yeah so from your first selection there to uh, Rio uh, approaching mm. Rio another uh, you know it's another a level altogether, right? An expectation yeah. around. It. I remember uh, seeing you in here in passing, and I mm. said, "Rich, I actually feel like there's maybe not any Australian sporting person carrying more expectation than yourself." And obviously, Cam going into Rio, um, and just looking at you with amazement. You know, you just seem to be so calm and collected. And I mean, this is probably you know, how did it play out in Rio? And you know. Um, and then the post mortem of Rio, how do you readjust and recalibrate? Obviously, any like, listening for the you know, yeah. didn't, you know, Cam went into the hundred uh, yeah. in the fifty with you know high expectations. Right. Certainly from the Australian sporting public, and I think that's, that's one right. thing the Australians do really well is we just create this expectation, <laughs> but that can come with its downsides. Oh, yeah. And then uh, you know, yeah. obviously, um, you know, the meat yeah. was probably Cam and yourself as a partnership. So it was a different meat for you guys and. The results didn't come as you know as probably expected. Mm. How um, how did how did you navigate that time in Rio and then you know after that? Yeah, that was a well, it was yeah a big experience for me. I, I was pretty calm. I thought leading in and uh, thanks for saying you know I mean I tried to um, you could feel the pressure there, but we're just going about our business and training was going pretty well and uh, Cam was you know he was in great shape going to Auburn and the staging camp doing some great things there and uh and look yeah the week didn't play out 
um, the way we would have hoped. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, whether the body was down a bit or pressure, we don't know if it's hidden there with the expectation. I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, he certainly deserved that number one. Uh, you know, that, that sort of expectation of winning, perhaps, so uh, very strong favourite. And uh, and I think it's more just trying to deal with that in the future is what we sort of took from Rio and, and, and how do we plan on dealing with those sort of, yeah, those pressures and expectations in the future. It may always be there. We, we don't know that. We've just got to be prepared for that, I think. Um, but, but just trying to have Cam at his best, um, even at his worst, be better than anyone could possibly be I suppose and there's some fantastic swimmers out there and and it is a very tough gig and uh take nothing away from anyone you know in the moment you've got to take your opportunity and um be at your best so uh yeah I mean there were events that he could have swum we decided on pulling out of uh just to give him a bit more uh rest I suppose or and also the relay teams for teammates to give them the best chance that was our idea behind that he'd always swum well in all those events, doing all those events um, in the past, but uh, but certainly the major meets has always been. Uh, not sure, you know, it can be taxing the 200. It's probably not his main event. He does very well at that also, and we'll, we'll continue to do that. But um, but even in other major meets, you know, he's done those events and not necessarily won the 100 either. He, he did at Pampax, which is a great did a great job there. And uh, so yeah, it's not any one thing. I don't think it's just a. The moment is big and, and I guess when you're top dog and you're not used to being that, he's kind of always been a little bit under the radar, Cam, I think. Uh, and certainly not the biggest guy out there, but he's a, he's a wonderful young man. You know, he's very uh, very humble and um, he took it on the chin very well and, and took nothing away from anyone. He swam amazingly well, the other the other guys, and put it together. So we're just going to look at what we're doing and I mean, try and piece it together again another time and get the rehearsal right for the future, you know. Well, it's that evaluated experience, isn't it? And yeah, uh, that's right. It's you can only go through it. Yep. And learn from that. So. Yep. And I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, your athlete can won everyone's hearts with that genuine, you know, appreciation for Cole Chalmers' performance. Yeah. And that, you know, that doesn't. That's not manufactured. That's real in the oh, moment. Real. And uh, and Very that's hard. Yeah. That's that humility and that character, which you know, when that character's there, with obviously the level of talent. You can only think there's great things to come. So, oh, I think so. Definitely, I agree with you. I mean, and that's I'm very proud to see him do that as well in that moment. Because as a coach, you try and pass on other things, you know, life experiences. For me, growing up in the country, you know, Western Queensland, um, my upbringing it, it, and part of his own upbringing and the way he is, you know, it's great to see that sort of sportsmanship in yeah. such a tough moment and yeah. someone else's wonderful moment. So it's great. It's, it's, it's potentially remembered just as much as sometimes, <laughs> you know, the diocese. It really is. Oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Rich, uh, moving away from Rio, let's go to a bit of coaching philosophy. Mm. Uh, some I call this the uh, the performance round, Rich. So I'm going to throw some quick-fire questions at uh-huh. you. Are you ready? Yep. As a coach, I ask this of the athletes all the time, so I get some answers from there side of the uh, ledger but as a coach what's the training session uh, you most love <laughs> like a training set yeah, yeah a training set or a session it can be you know, it can be the topic or it can be the, the micro of what that session entails oh, I do love uh, oh, I do love a Saturday morning we often do pace 50s on a Saturday morning and just the the group you know, we might have three waves of you know, world class athletes going at it on, on a pace 50 set, you know, 200 pace, and often they'll come down to 100 back end speed by the end of it, just all challenging each other, you know, over um, over a couple of k's worth of 50s, you know, and it's fantastic to see them all uh, pushing each other to the nth degree. So that's what I enjoy that sort of that vibe and feeling <laughs> on a Saturday morning in training. Saturday morning session you most dislike, Rich? <laughs> Probably Friday morning because <laughs> they're, they're fairly buckled from the whole week of training, and I there's a, I challenge them a lot. And there's a lot of work going through the week, and you know sometimes they're okay. It's generally a recovery and a little bit of speed work, but um, yeah, and I'm not on their back too much, but yeah, it can be. They're a little bit slower <laughs> Friday morning. <laughs> Rich, for you as a coach, I mean, uh, a day in the life of Richard scarce. Uh, bedtime, morning time. What's your bedtime and your get up time? Oh, generally, I try to be bed around 10, sometimes a bit later and a bit naughty there. I start doing programs or 
<clears throat> go off on tangents and, <laughs> and then yeah. I realise it's a bit late and then I'll get up at sort of 4.30 in the morning, although, you know, a couple of years ago I was training every day of the year and I'd sort of get up at, yeah, 3.30 and train at 4 myself and then coach them at 5. But um, these days we sort of start about 5.30 uh, and with it, the squad, yeah, yeah, and then the day is sort of programming through the day. Back there after lunch, we get home about 7 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night and that's our that's our week, you know, and Saturday morning as well. This week we got a competition at Southport, so just that's a, it, it sort of plays out like that most of the year. So you know, five days a week, they're more or less more than twelve hour days, and then uh, weekends can be competitions and travel and. Yeah, it's just a lot of management. I think they've got gym. They've got yeah. you know, you've just got things. You work with the sports scientists, my coaching staff. We just planning and that sort of thing, you know, and and it's it's good fun though. I mean, it's we love what we do. So, but it's yeah, it's clearly pretty clearly. hectic. Rich, uh, who's the athlete that you most admire and why? And it doesn't have to be from the swimming world. It can be just from your own coaching philosophies. It can be anything. could be one of your athletes. My swimmers laugh. I always carry on about Farlap, <laughs> <laughs> the race horse. Um, oh, probably Michael Phelps. I do carry on about Michael Phelps a lot. Our own Australian swimmers, uh, Kieran Perkins. Armstrong, you know, Thorpey, those guys. There's a lot of them. Yeah, Michael Phelps, I, I find, is an extraordinary athlete. Um, yeah, to, to win that amount of gold medals or Olympic medals, uh, longevity, his consistency in the sport over the years, along with his coach, I think that relationship they have there, yeah, I think that's uh, quite, quite amazing. It's a great... Um, they can learn a lot from that, I think, swimmers. and doesn't have to be exactly the same way, but I think there's a lot of message there and the consistency of his career from your lens obviously mm. as an elite level swimming coach and swimming coach what do you think is the one thing that you know what do you think mate has made felt such an endearing you know and successful athlete oh we had a couple of um i mean he started so well as a youngster at 15 he made a final and he just sort of from there his uh, his grit determination to be back in the pool training every day you know, for six years, for example, everyone knows those stories uh, with his coach. To and within a year, world record holder, and just hitting those goals and the consistency he's, he's uh, um, gone under to, to, to manage that. <clears throat> and I think, um, yeah, even at, at age thirty-one, uh, you know, he's had a couple of everyone has a, makes a few mistakes on their journey in life as well, and he's rectified that and been very honest with his workload coming back into it and, and with, along with his coach and stuck to that what he knows works and I think his rehearsal around that's the big the big key thing for me like like ballet dancers always related to that they're, they're very well, well rehearsed till they go to the big stage it's a lot of work goes in and I think when you've done that well enough um, then more often than not the opportunity comes and often for Phelps it pays off, like Cavage and Phelps and the 100 fly, and of course it goes his way. So that's what I find with him, most magic, yeah. Rich, uh, is there a mantra, that is there a saying or a couple of mantras that you like to, you know, maybe it's individual for your athletes, um, mm. but you like them to, you know, uh, have going through their head as they're racing? Do you get into some of the mantras, think about this, obviously there's technique prompts you're always sharing. Yeah. Any general ones or maybe not? I use a little man from the Snow River sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what that is. Oh, I, don't want, <laughs> I think I use it for um, pan packs for Cam. Like, um, and usually, if I keep it pretty simple, because I can, yeah, I love to talk. But I, um, but generally, I'm pretty quiet in the in the moment. Like, I'll go off and talk to him by myself. No one really hears what I'm saying. But I think before pan packs, it was shocking weather, and Cam hates the cold. But then everyone was under the pump. Yeah, everyone was in the same boat. But I just said to him, uh, you know, I think. In Manfred Snow River, when they come to the top of the ridge and they see that the mob, the horses down below, and uh, the, the the manager of the property says, you know, All right, boys, no no need for fancy riding today. You go at them from the jump. <laughs> and he did. I think. Remember, someone got a photo. It might have been Julian McDonald <laughs> sent it to me, and his feet were off the block um, before theirs had even left. You know, he had such a great start, you know, reaction, and just attacked it early. Yeah, and that was he went at it from the jump. Brilliant, mate. So, the man from <laughs> so when we see future successes, we'll know that there's some magic. Oh, it movie. could be anything. Yeah, Braveheart, whatever. <laughs> Rich, is there a recovery tip? Uh, what's your what's your top recovery tip? General, in general, for physical performance. Just in general. Oh, in general, uh, like I, I learned a lot from my wife with uh, nutrition. I think that's a key one. Um, 
really be mindful around that. Uh, sleeping. Uh, also, I think just downtime for the guys. Surfing, I think they generally love to get out in the surf and just have a light paddle or a body surf and just really enjoy it and just relax yeah. in the ocean and, and, and just chill out and, and, and let the body come up. Is there a minimum hours of sleep you like the guys to have? or you, Oh, you just not really. Some, some are seven, some are more. Yeah. I mean, for me, it might be seven. Yeah. Cam might be different if it's nine or whatever, but just be consistent with that. And, 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 I, and probably nothing, even on the weekends, no more than two hours either side of that, mm-hmm. if they can manage it. You know, it might be the end of a season. They might have a little yeah. night out with the friends and just yeah. enjoy themselves. But, but just in general, consistency-wise, I like that sort of keep it fairly... Uh, Consistent. The same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mostly. Yeah. A lot to be said for that. Um, Rich, uh, two more on the performance round. What's the best part about coaching? Oh, just love all the relationships. You know, the athletes are, um, they work so hard for you and there's a lot of ups and downs and, and you ride through that together along with your coaching peers and, uh, yeah, good or bad results. It's just such a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. It's, it's very uh, infectious and, yeah, I really enjoy it to, to help people and they also help the coaches as well. So it's, yeah. when you're positive about it all and have a great attitude towards it, I think it's, it's a wonderful uh, Vocation. What's the toughest part, Rich, about coaching? Uh, I, I think being away from home sometimes uh, and sometimes if a result doesn't come off, it's hard to sort of – I think everyone understands it, but I think it's also hard to swallow. You, you feel rough yourself and for your athlete together, you know, you're a team and family and extended family and friends, so that's – that's always hard. Never, everyone understands, but you go through that together, and that, that's the tough part, I think. Because, I mean, from Rio, you were away from, you know, beautiful girls yeah, and, and Bronnie for a month, and a, and, half month and, and a half. Yeah. So it's no insignificant amount of time. That's right, and, and, and there were some good results with relays and, and certain parts of it and learning and, uh, and not so good in other counts um, with certain races, perhaps. But, yeah, look, all in all, it's not all uh, it's certainly hard work when you're away on stage in camps as well. It's a lot of training and getting ready and... And then in the moment, you just want to uh, try and make everyone happy in Australia. And <laughs> yeah, if, um, but I'm, I'm glad we got another Australian boy got up. That was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it is a very tough gig yeah. at the Olympics. Everyone around the world now is, and even the smaller countries, caught up, catching up in front. It's just one very competitive. Yeah. So, yeah. Across all sports. Yeah. Rich, uh, what's on your bucket list personally and in sport? Oh, personally. Um, I don't know. Personally, I'm sort of. Uh, I'd like to do a stint overseas. I think family talk about going overseas one day down the track and doing work over there for a couple of years. Um, not sure where yet. <laughs> Some nice location, perhaps. But um, yeah, just staying fit in general, enjoying watching the girls grow up. Sub- Give them a great opportunity. Um, Sub 39 minute 10k <laughs> this year. Yeah, that's a. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing well getting my foot right. I'm, I'm trying to. That's probably that's partly my fault. Uh, <laughs> or coaching on decks not, it doesn't help that. But it's um, yeah, I like little goals like that. I'm just like to stay fit, <clears throat> mentally and physically, and I think it helps my coaching. Yeah, that personally, and, and I think the family as well. We we try to do that as a family also. And um, <clears throat> uh, in in the coaching side of it, mm. yeah, I, I'd like to sort of. I like to do reasonably well at world champs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got uh, a few things we feel like we, uh, as a coaching group, <clears throat> my team and and swimmers, we feel like we can really do some uh, some good work there, uh, firstly at trials and, yeah, just trying to maximise that potential, I think, yeah. this year for world champs. Rich, a fun question. Mm. If you could have dinner with three people, who would who'd be at that dinner table? Oh, live in, uh, live in <clears throat> or...? You know, or not like in past. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, yeah, look, I've always... Arnold Schwarzenegger, I've always been a bit of a fan of Arnie. Well, <laughs> he's well, he'll take a, up three spots because of the size. Yeah, of him, that's we'll right. Give, yeah. We'll still give you two more. Michael Phelps is probably another one. All right, so this is looking like a pretty interesting table. Yeah. Arnold, um, Phelps, Richard. Oh. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, coaching-wise... Uh, yeah. Actually, Muhammad Ali is the other one. Jesus, some, uh, pardon the pun, but some big hitters at that table. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Including yeah, yourself, Rich. Yeah, interesting people, yeah, yeah. interesting people. Right, that's, a, that's an awesome table. Rich, two questions to go. Uh, if you could 
boil down all your coaching wisdom from all the years, successes and the, mm. the valleys and the troughs, <clears throat> highs and the lows and everything in between. What's one bit of advice you'd give to people across the board looking to perform at their phys- physical best? Yeah, look, I think nothing, nothing is for certain, and I've never thought that ever anyway at the highest level nothing's for certain i think the main thing is um for me of is the consistency i keep saying that word but i think the rehearsal and consistency and and just going that extra mile as often as you can and uh but if you ever think it's enough it it won't be i just believe yeah you gotta look for that point of difference and stick at it, and if you can do that, you have give yourself every opportunity of doing your very best. Yeah, wow. Well. Rich, uh, last question. Uh, what's uh, the physical challenge that Rich scares or issue listeners? So every week, guests on the show, the program, issue listeners, a physical challenge it can be entry level, it can be extremely difficult. We've had running 20Ks plus through to you know, a few pull-ups. What's Rich kind of prescribe or challenge the listeners to for swimming it could be anything mate it could be swimming i'd expect that maybe oh. it could, could could be something to do with water oh yeah um swimming wise it's a tough one depending on your level i suppose um oh i don't know that's a tough one i think always making like 2100s freestyle is always a tough one on 130 <laughs> but i think if you start on two minutes and just coming down on each on a, on a five second drop cycle um, to the fastest cycle you can manage, and then every every two weeks trying to improve on that, dropping the cycle, you know, dropping to the lower cycle you can, um, and increasing the hundreds, I suppose. Yeah, it's a tough one though. Hundreds are like four hundreds of the track. Yeah. I always find them a tough a tough challenge. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> so, listeners, if you take on this swimming challenge, uh, let us know. Tag us in the social. Rich, uh, if people did want to find out more about your journey, about the squad, mm. where can they go? We'll tag this up in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Bond um, University. Yeah. Swimming. I think um, they put a lot of Instagram. Uh, yeah, Bond Swimming Instagram. The website, Bond Swimming University. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's about it, really. We don't really uh, – I'm not on it much myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm not big on it. I know my assistant coach puts a bit up. So, so we'll uh, to follow we'll, it, you know. To, we'll tag yeah. up those listeners on the show notes. Yeah, I've got to throw in a sneaky one, Rich. I just, I'm just curious. Mm. What do you reckon the human potential is for the hundred meter free and the fifty meter free in, in times? What do you reckon the potentially yeah. possible? Certainly, trying to break the, after the post suit era. You know, the world record is twenty point nine and forty six nine. I think 45 is certainly a goer in the 100. As in to get into when the 45s? Yeah, when yeah. it's pieced together properly, um, certainly. Um, people have got to get that in their head. The return 50, how fast they can get out and how relaxed they can be out, what they can return in. I think that's very possible. It's a hard barrier to break, but I, I think it's possible. Um, 20 second barrier is very tough, I think. But yeah, 20 point, I don't think it's too far away. Wow. There in, you the, go. in the near future, going you know, 20 points, there's a lot of 21 lows. But So if you're listening to this in it's 20... It's just more the belief, I think, behind it. The belief, yeah. mindset. Yeah, mindset. I think mindset's the just the, it's a limitation, isn't it? With that, Richard Scarce, thanks so much for uh, popping in, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, oh. wish you every success for the coming years. And uh, one thing, listeners, that you know, if you meet Rich, uh, he's such a humble bloke. And uh, if Rich went through and you know, named some of the athletes he's helped and helping perform at their physical best in the water, you know, it's a star-studded lineup. And obviously, that's courtesy of your uh, of your approach, mate. So, um, so, mate, well done. All the best for the years ahead. Thank you very much, Brad Beer. Thank you. Look, thanks for having me here at Pogo. And um, look, it's just great to speak with you, mate. And uh, very kind words. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, listeners, there you have it. Another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been enjoying these episodes. If you have, feel free to share it around. If you've enjoyed this episode, as I 
always do, feel free to leave a review. It's my request on iTunes. Simply click ratings and reviews and review away. We've got the aim of trying to hit 100 reviews before the one-year anniversary. We're sitting at 71 at the time of recording today. So, guys, if you're out there, you've been enjoying the program, if you could take a minute to jump over to iTunes, click ratings and review, one star, five star, whatever it is, uh, really would appreciate a review if you've been enjoying the program. An enormous thank you once again to you, the show listeners, and the people behind the scenes that make this show possible. Uh, In particular, Daryl Misson, audio engineer, guru, and Susan Wilkin, the show's VA. Thank you very much, guys. If you'd like to keep the episodes flowing, be sure to hit subscribe inside your app or device, and that just automatically populates the show into your device each week. Copy of the show notes, guys, can be found over at pogophysio.com.au and there you'll also find the social media activity around the program as well. Lastly, if you're into running and you'd like to pick up a copy of my Amazon running and jogging bestseller, you can run pain-free. You can now do so over on iBooks or Audible, so it's available now in the audio format and of course in paperback edition via pogophysio.com.au or Amazon, of course. It's a great read for anyone that's looking to get the most out of their running and to enjoy running injury-free and therefore running at their best as a result of that. Guys, coming up next week on the Physical Performance Show, episode 51, I sat down whilst here at Hamilton Island and caught up with the reigning and current 2016-17 Nutrigrain, Kellogg's Nutrigrain Ironman champion, Mr. Matt Poole. Matt had a ding-dong battle with another former guest of this program, this show, Shannon Eckstein, on the final day uh, down at Cronulla recently to take out the title. We're only about a month at the time of recording the interview for Matt post his victory there. So it's been a whirlwind few weeks for Matt and uh, it was great to sit down and catch up, unpack the success that he had with his debut Nutrigrain title. You're going to really enjoy it. Matt's a real character. So be sure to tune in next week to the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Deer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Hold up. 